Since his death at the Little Bighorn in 1876, George Armstrong Custer has had many detractors, but he has also found numerous partisans intent on defending his reputation. Custer partisans argue that Custer's plan was not a bad one. Reno's initial charge, whatever his subsequent actions may have been, spooked the village and sent thousands of women and children fleeing north to escape. By pivoting to the north and crossing the river, Custer could have captured large numbers of hostages and paralyzed the Indians' will to fight. Custer stationed a portion of his immediate command on the ridge overlooking the village, summoned reinforcements, Benteen, and made a reconnaissance in force further to the right to find a fording place. Custer found a crossing point at the far northern end of the village, but did not have sufficient men with him to exploit the opportunity. Custer returned and took up positions below and to the west of Custer Hill at the extreme end of his line, where he awaited Benteen's arrival with the reinforcements. Up to this point, Custer felt himself in control of the situation and on the offensive, never considering withdrawal as an option. Of course, the reinforcements never arrived. Custer's defenders argue that there were three reasons Custer was defeated at the Little Bighorn. One, the Indians were better armed. Two, the low character of the regular troops and three, the cowardice and disobedience of Custer's subordinate officers, namely Major Marcus Reno and Captain Frederick Benteen. Frederick Whitaker writes, Sitting Bull's truest and most persistent allies were the Indian Department and the Indian traders who supplied him with Winchester rifles and ammunition so that his men were better armed than the troops of the cavalry. Archaeologist Richard Fox says, because of the rugged and broken terrain at the Little Bighorn, the Indians, armed with repeating rifles, were able to creep within firing range of the cavalry, which was unusual. Thus, the repeater, as instrument of shock, coupled with the liability of the single-shot carbine used by the cavalry, contributed significantly to demoralization. The shock effect was magnified by the likelihood, based on archaeological data, that the Indians had at least 200 repeating rifles. James Donovan writes that the regiment Custer believed invincible was no elite unit. The frontier army was small, ill-trained, and badly equipped by a miserly Congress. The quality of the troops was low. Donovan says, only the malingerers, the bounty jumpers, the draft sneaks, and the worthless remained in the army after the Civil War. He continues, these, with the scum of the cities and frontier settlements, constituted more than half the rank and file on the plains. Training in marksmanship, horsemanship, skirmishing, any practical lessons that Indian fighting might actually involve was virtually non-existent. Custer's defenders lay most of the blame for defeat on disloyal, treacherous, and cowardly men who abandoned their leader. They say that Custer's invariable method of attack was the same, which he adopted at the Little Bighorn, an attack on front and flank. Custer counted much on the shock effect to be produced on an enemy, whatever the size of the village, by combined attacks and a crossfire. Only one thing could prevent victory, and this was the cowardice or disobedience of the officers in command of any of the supporting wings, which were to work simultaneously. Custer died, they say, because Major Reno's cowardice and Captain Benteen's disobedience. Reno was ordered to charge. He obeyed by opening a hesitating skirmish and then running away. 
Benteen was ordered to come on, be quick. He obeyed by advancing three miles in two hours and joining Reno in a three-hour halt. He stopped and let his chief perish.